Hello, I'm Elaine Patricelli. I'm from Book Passage, uh, the independent bookstore in Corte Madera and San Francisco's Ferry Building, where we've been bringing writers and readers together for 45 years. We also have a very active website called bookpassage.com. And we're really excited tonight because we get to partner with a store that we all admire so much, Third Place Books in Seattle. Uh, Third Place Books has been uh, a leader in the industry since 1998. They have three stores in Lake Forest Park and Ravenna, and uh, uh, I think it's called Steered Park. Somebody may correct me. Uh, but both of us, both stores are sisters. We are committed to the creation of community through the book and the ideas that we find in books. So I hope you'll support both stores. And one way to do that is to buy the books of our authors tonight from either Third Place Books or Book Passage. I'm really thrilled about our event tonight. I have been waiting for this event. I've been waiting for this book. Every time I've seen Elizabeth George, I've been asking, how's it going? How's it going? <laughs> uh, it's not a, it was, it, she, it's not something that she just whips out in a day. I, when I received the advanced readers copy for that book passage and third place books received, I just cleared my calendar. <laughs> All the other books that were sitting there saying, read me, read me, read me, I put under the bed because I knew I was going to sit and read this book and have a great week with Inspector Thomas Lindley and Sergeant Barbara, Detective Sergeant Barbara Hare, Havers. And I knew that there were going to be incredible characters. I, For me, Something to Hide uh, is one of the most important of the 21 Lindley novels that Susan Elizabeth George has written. Because in this one, she is dealing with all kinds of characters from very different backgrounds, in the London area, and she is also dealing with female genital mutilation. Now, isn't that a cheery subject? Mm -hmm. But when you read Elizabeth George, you become so immersed in every detail that you feel these people are in your life and that you are part of their lives. And it is an amazing book, and I'm thrilled to be launching it on Pub Date. Uh, Elizabeth George is also a great writing teacher and author of other books. She has some great young adult books uh, set on the island where she lives, and also uh, two fabulous writing books, Right Away and Mastering the Process. We recently hosted her through our friends at Five Things on a absolutely wonderful class, and although the class on editing my own work has uh, is no longer live. You can go to fivethings.com and sign up for it. So if you are writing and editing might be of interest, you might try that. But just forget, you know, we can't travel that much right now. You don't need to just read something to hide. And I'm so thrilled that uh, Lori Frankel is here. I just learned that Elizabeth George was Lori Frankel's first fan. She wrote her her first fan letter back when Lori's first book, The Atlas of Love, came out. Uh, all of Lori's books have absolutely fabulous characters. And this new one, one, two, three, is no exception. It is my. Each time I read one of Lori's books, I say, oh, that's my favorite. Uh, but this one really is my favorite. It's set in a town that has been decimated by a chemical con uh, company and triplets are telling us their story. They are teenagers and they are fascinating. I won't tell you too much more, but it may come up in the discussion. You need to read one, two, three. And now I'm going to sign, turn this over 
to Lori Frankel so that she and Elizabeth George can spend the rest of the hour chatting together. Thank you. Recording in progress. That was amazing. Thank you for that. That's very, very kind of you. Um, I'm, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm a fan girl for sure for both of you. <laughs> Which I, I mean, I love it. I love it. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, it's really nice to see your face. It's, uh, oh, it's great it's to see you too, Lori. It's been a long time since um, since we've been together in person. Yeah. yeah, it's been a long time since we've been with anyone except our immediate family. Yes, yes. And it's heartbreaking because you're so close. And, um, and yet it has been so long. Congratulations on this book. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. This book, you all, is amazing. I, I want to thank everybody who's out there. I can't see you, but I, but I know that you're there, and I'm, and I'm so glad that you're there. I'm so grateful to you for joining us this evening. Look at this book. It's, I mean, look how big it is. Um, in fact, I did the opposite of Elaine, which is that they sent it to me, and I put it away because I knew it was going to eat my it was going to eat my my brain when I started it, that I wanted to be able to clear my schedule. So I waited for the holidays um, so that I could have, so that, in fact, after the holidays, after everybody went home, so that I could have my like rainy days. And, um, and in fact, there was a snowstorm um, so that I could have absolutely nothing to do but sit and read this novel. And it's that kind of a book. So it's really, it's like the perfect winter book. It's the perfect thing to um, clear a few, a few weeks with and just luxuriate in. I feel it's a very luxurious book. So we're going to talk about all of that too. Yeah, it's like um, it's so long and sort of like clear a month, you know? <laughs> well, it is. It's so long. And I have lots of questions about that. I actually have lots of questions about all sorts of things, but I do want to invite people to um, ask questions if you've got them. I'll, I'll read them down from the bottom of the chat. I've gotten pretty good over the last two years of Zoom events of reading while talking at the same time. Um, so if you have questions, ask them. I have lots, although in fact, I'm gonna scrap, I have a whole outline of things that we might wanna talk about, but I'm gonna at least table it for the moment because you said something in the green room and I thought, well, we should start there, which is, this is the 21st book in this series. And right. you said it was the hardest one to write. So I wonder if, I mean, they should get easier. <laughs> um, yeah, they, but do they? They don't, they don't for me, do they for you? No, no, they, each one is harder than the previous. Yeah, that's what's so um, interesting about writing is that um, if, especially if you aren't cranking out, uh, you know, the same kind of novel all the time. For me, I always wanted each novel to be a leap ahead of the last novel as far as style and, and technique go. But what made this novel particularly difficult was actually the, uh, the chronology of events. The, uh, the, the thing is that, um, you know, when, you, when you're writing a crime novel, uh, I, I think of the plot as a wave that's breaking and um, in writing a crime novel, uh, you want the reader to be either swimming desperately to catch up with the wave or riding the wave on the top. But the last place you want the reader to be is in front of the wave. So what I realized as I was writing the book is that I kept putting the reader in front of the wave. And, um, and it has to do with the fact that my, my crime, my uh, crime fighters, Lindley and Havers, don't come into the novel until about a hundred and some pages in. And that's quite deliberate. Um, but what that meant is that the reader couldn't know stuff that Lindley and Havers then discover 50 pages, 150 pages later. And so I had to be really careful with how I set up the chronology. And every, every time I'd start again, I'd get, you know, I get so far into the book and then realize, oh my God, no, it still doesn't work. And then I'd start all over again. So, uh, so it took me five, uh, five drafts. To, to get it and and many many flow charts I had flow charts everywhere and and you know scene analyses and all kinds of stuff but um, it, it was tough and I was really glad when uh, when I was able actually to put it to bed at my publishing house <laughs> I'm sure oh it's the best feeling when it starts to when it starts to come together and you think like okay, oh yeah yeah when you work. finally realize okay I got it yeah I've got it yeah. yeah. This is a complicated book in a lot of ways. Um, so that must have contributed to the challenges too. What, like, 
one of the things that kept striking me is, oh, you think in a crime novel with a murder, it's going to be like good guys and bad guys. But actually, everyone in this book kind of falls in between and has really, you, you present really good arguments on all sides of a lot of really complicated issues. Yeah, that's be, yeah, and 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 my my feeling is that unless uh, unless I'm writing about uh, a serial killer, which I you know I did for for one of my novels, mostly what happens in my books is that people make decisions uh, that unfortunately lead them in the wrong in the wrong direction. Sometimes they make those decisions because they really feel they have to, and, and I think in particular in in, uh, in the crime in this novel, the uh, the perpetrator of the crime, you know, sort of feels this is the only option, and I think that happens a, a lot in my books, where the, the criminal or the you know the person who commits the crime, who's not a career criminal, makes a a bad decision or a series of bad decisions, but to that person they seem like the only decision that that's possible. So uh, I try to make the characters in my books people that um, that the reader gets the feeling had a life before the book began and will continue to have a life after the book ends. So, uh, it, so one of the ways that I attempt to do that is by being really careful of my in how I construct characters in the first place. So that I try to make them as you know as well rounded as I possibly can, with complete backgrounds, with uh, with needs and desires and uh, and you know uh, and psychopathologies, things like that. So that when they when they're on the page, you have that sense that you're looking at somebody who's who's a real person. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. They feel. I mean, I I finished the book. A couple weeks ago, and I'm still thinking about about these people um, because because indeed they're so fleshed out, and I and I got to know them so well. Did you know it was going to be this long going in? No, no, I, I never know how long a book's going to be. It usually depends on on the number of characters whose subplot I decide to delve into, and that's actually what lengthens my books. If if I wrote only the crime story. Yeah. That was all that was involved. Of course, then the books would be much shorter. But I never really wanted to write simple crime novels. And by simple, I mean it, a, a book that's really about the investigation into a crime. I I wanted to write a, a bigger novel than that. And yeah. so I wanted to be able to explore character and to explore place. And if I'm going to explore character by looking at that character's subplot by delving into it, then that's going to make the book longer. I never set out to do that. Actually, my books are a lot longer. And then I start slashing as I, as I, you know, write successive drafts. But um, so I try to get them down as much as I possibly can. But the, uh, but I do like to give the reader a full experience of the lives of these people. And that just, you know, that takes pages, that takes time. And uh, so that's why they uh, they end up as long as they are. They are. I mean, it's like a treat. It's like two books in one. You know, it's just it's it feel, that's a, the word I keep coming back to is luxurious. It feels like you know, like lying in the bath. It's just it's it's there's so much of it. There's it's so lovely in all of the, the different directions. It also feels very Dickensian to me. And um, you know what? Well, I'll take is. that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, you know, it is because what I'm trying to, you know, I, I like the reader to have a sense of where a book is taking place. And in this case, uh, the, you know, the book takes place in London, but in various neighborhoods in London. I always like to say that, um, you know, the typical tourist uh, in London would never be going to the places that I end up going to look at <laughs> as a potential location. So, but I like to, uh, you know, give the reader the feeling of actually being there with the, you know, with the sights and the details and the smells and the sounds. And, uh, and so all of the places that I write about are, you know, are, are real places. Even when I, uh, even when I write about a, uh, like a village in the countryside and give it a different name, 
it's still based on a real village that I happened to visit. But in this case, you know, all these various neighborhoods in uh, Northeast London, which is where the really the majority of the book, the book takes place, all of those uh, neighborhoods are there. And one of the, the uh, finds that I had that I really, really uh, liked was finding um, Trinity Green in, uh, in East London. And that was just the most amazing place. And it was one of those serendipitous things where when I got there uh, and, and uh, Trinity Green is, is a set of almshouses that were built in the, uh, in the 1600s for, the, uh, the, the, for, for sailors who were, and for the wives and widows of sailors. And so they're, they're you know, charity housing. And, and they're still there. This is one of the things I love about London. They don't tear things down and put up a mini mall or something. So anyway, <laughs> these, these are there. They're listed buildings. And when I was there to check them out, as luck would have it, one of them was being worked on. And uh, so I was able to talk to the guys who were working on it. And they and asked, <laughs> sort of invited myself inside so that I could actually see the place. And they explained to me you know, what it was, what they were going to do with it and, uh, and what it was like. And, uh, and then at the end of Trinity Green was this very, very old chapel. And at, the, at that point, when I was doing that research, I didn't know what was going to happen there. Uh, I just knew that it was a great location and that I had to use it. And ultimately, it, you know, I did use it and it became a really major location in the book. But it's that kind of thing that I really love to do to give that sense of place. And again, it's yet another thing that makes the books longer. Right, sure. Yeah, I mean, okay, can I, I have to show the cover in case people don't have their hands on it yet and are gonna buy it later. But it's very, I mean, I loved it from the first page because it's super, it's super London. I mean, it's it's got yeah. London, you know, it's yeah. a nice, uh, it, it feels very, it's very atmospheric and very evocative. And, and that would have been really great anyway, but in this time when I can't go to London, we don't, we cannot travel mm -hmm. at the moment, it became a really remarkable thing to read this book that does such a beautiful job of, of setting and of describing where it is. And it, like, it becomes armchair travel, which is, which yeah. is really remarkable. I love, I personally love books that do that. I always have. I've gone to so many places because I've read about them in a novel, not in a, you know, not in a travel book, but I've read about them in a novel. And I thought, oh, this sounds like such a cool place to go. Yeah. And so I've gone there. Yeah. Uh, that's why I ended up on the Isle of Skye. That's why I went to Corfu. I mean, that's why I've been to many, many places in, in England and in London. Um, and it's just like, it's just a wonderful experience to be able to uh, take, take that out of a book and uh, make it your own experience as well. Were you able to go this time? Well, for to do the research for this book, sh sure, because the research for this book was done pre-COVID. So, because uh, this book took a heck of a long time to write. There was no COVID then, and uh, <laughs> so I was able to go quite easily from, you know, around London. Um, we had this sort of brief hiatus before the Omicron variant came out and, uh, and, and took over. And so in that hiatus, I was actually able to go uh, back to England. And this was in, uh, in September when we had only the Delta variant. And, uh, and I decided to go, to go over there, not for this novel, but for the next, uh, the next Lindley novel, which is going to take place in Corfu. So I had that window of opportunity and I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to take it. Um, and they did have the Delta variant at that time. And I, I did discover much to my uh, horror that the, uh, the people in London were not taking any of this very seriously. Um, and so, especially in, uh, in Cornwall, where they had big signs outside of both Penzance and St. Ives saying, you know, the Delta variant is very active here, please wear a mask. Ah, people were kind of running around, not wearing masks. I had a mask on, but yeah, so, uh, but I was really glad that I was able to go there and, and spend that time. So now if I go back, if I'm ever able to go back, then I'll, I'll just have to fine tune the stuff that I've already seen, you know, just sort of adding more texture to it. Yes, yes. Oh, it worked. I mean, you did a really, really beautiful job. I, I Thank felt, you. I felt like I was there, and I miss it. And it was really, it was really. Oh, I appreciate nice to be that. There. Thank you. 
What other research did you do for this book? Well, this book was a lot of the research I ended up doing, I ended up doing on the, uh, you know, the world's major resource, the, the internet. And, <laughs> and I, I used um, documents that were, that I found on the internet, but I, and I also found interviews. And then I, um, I hopped onto YouTube which turned out to be really a, a kind of a wonderful resource because there were on YouTube a number of filmed interviews with, uh, with women who had experienced what the women in this book experienced. There was also a TED Talk by uh, a woman who has uh, started an organization um, called Dahlia, um, and it, that, that is, uh, she is a, she's a victim of, of this particular kind of, of uh, mutilation. And I listened to her as, as well, and listened to what she had to say. So all of the, the, the things that, that, the, uh, that the women describe in the book as happening to them are things that actually have happened to, to women, mostly in the, in the Sudan and, uh, and in, and in Nigeria and in, in various other countries, not only in Africa, but also uh, also in uh, in India as well. Yeah, yes. And it made the book, it makes the book very timely um, in, a, in a way that, um, what do I want to say about that? It's because you do so much character and so much place and so much setting, um, you, I sort of often think that books like that, the the kind of timely contemporary current stuff goes by the wayside. But in fact, you got all of that in there too. Um, this is very much a book, well, there's lots about, about race and about immigrants and immigration and immigrant communities. Um, there was lots about, about women and violence against women, but also about women's empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get all of that? What went into making this book timely like that, contemporary, in addition to all of the other things that it is? Well, the first thing was that I wanted, to, I decided to explore an issue that I uh, that I felt that not everyone uh, knew about, and uh, not everyone was uh, aware that was that it was still happening um, in in like. In places like London, you wouldn't expect a great uh, civilized city like that to have things like this going on, and yet they are. So that was sort of my jumping off point. And as I began creating the characters, I realized that, that really thematically, what I was looking at based on the way I created the characters was women um, owning their power. That that women were going that women had the opportunity to take their power back. Various well, pretty much all the women in the book do have that uh, that ability to take their power back. Whether it is something as you know as amusing as um, Barbara Havers being able to you know to put a period to the curse of Dorothea Harriman <laughs> trying to find her man, you know, which was which was great fun <laughs> to write. Um, whether it's that, whether it's uh, you know Deborah St. James finally making it clear to her husband that you know that, that she's an individual and he's not treating her like the adult she is, nor has he ever treated her that way. And uh, and so she's she's taking that power back. And certainly uh, Lindley's um, uh, Lindley's lover Deidre Traher, uh, I you know that that final scene between Lindley and Deidre Traher. I, you know, I have to say that I loved that scene. Yes. And when I was done with it, I thought, my God, this does exactly what I wanted it to do. <laughs> um, and it was just, it was, it was just wonderful. And, uh, and how Lindley's realization, you know, how it comes upon him, what he's been doing to women for his whole life. And, uh, and it's finally made clear to him. And so it's really through these women who, uh, who take their power. You know, the one woman who sort of starts out in a position of power and keeps that position of power um, really is uh, Winston Nkato's mother um, because she is, you know, she's from the get-go. 
she is sort of like it doesn't take any anything from anyone and does not shy away from saying the things that are difficult for you know for other women to hear so uh so so she was sort of like the shining example of uh of the of this woman and who has this amazing relationship with you know with her husband Winston and Cotta's father and you know I sort of love the fact that he still lives with his parents in this uh, in this apartment in uh on the on the estate in Brixton, which is, you know, Brixton is sort of their state is trying to become gentrified, but it's really having trouble getting there. Um, but I love that, love that relationship um, because I've never really explored that before. I mean, we know Winston Carter has parents. We know that his brother's in prison. Um, we know that his mother calls him Jewel. And, uh, you know, so the things we know about them, but we've never really seen them all in action together. And uh, and I liked I liked being able to do that. And I liked being her being able to demonstrate for Monifa, the, the terribly abused uh, uh, wife of the Nigerian immigrant, she's really able to uh, to demonstrate for her that she, Monifa, has power. It's waiting for her. All she has to do is take it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you did such a good job. Um, do you like, do you prefer writing the, the characters who recur or the characters who are new? Oh, Oh, that's a that's a really interesting question. Well, I'm always, you know, I, I always create the new characters and the other, you know, of course, my continuing characters have been there all along. Um, and so the, the creative process when I'm dealing with the character is like this one opportunity for me to be a god and, uh, you know, to, to from the very bottom of the, you know, of the of the uh, the substance of a human being to be able to create up out of that, uh, like that little little kernel of an idea and the kernel of the idea as far as the character is concerned is like, who is this person in the story? And so it's like, okay, this person is going to be this uh, Nigerian woman married to uh, a man who is much older than she is and uh, having by this man two children, a, uh, a, a teenage boy in his late teenage years getting ready for manhood and then this little girl who is much younger. And uh, so I have this, you know, this this creation of character that is really kind of it's really a, really fun to do. It's, uh, it takes a long time, but it's really very satisfying. I'd say more satisfying than fun. Um, <laughs> well, to worry. But, but I will say that um, as I write individual scenes in which my uh, continuing characters come onto the page for the first time. I feel such joy seeing yes. them. You know, I'm reminded of I'm, I'm reminded of what uh, you know P. D. James said, and she was always sort of giving a uh, you know sort of poo pooing the fact that um, that Dorothy L. Sayers was in love with Peter Whimsey. This is what P. D. James said. Clearly, you know, she's in love with Peter Whimsey. But my feeling is. That's what makes Peter Whimsy such a great character is yeah. that the writer loved him. You know, if you're going to spend your entire career with a character, yeah. it certainly helps to love the character rather than, you know, poor Agatha Christie said that she was so, she made such a big mistake when she created or killed Poirot as this, you know, retired Belgian detective with an egg-shaped head, patent leather shoes, who liked to drink hot chocolate. You know, she didn't give herself a whole lot to work with. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. really, unless somebody poisons his hot chocolate or like an illegitimate child pops up, which is not likely to happen in <laughs> the Agatha Christie yeah. book. So, uh, but I really liked, uh, you know, liked these characters that were that were fully drawn. So it's a just it's a real pleasure for me to see them because I continue to learn more and more about these characters that I created initially to you know to carry the bulk of the investigation. And that's a, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, interesting, um, interesting. How is like how different is is book twenty one from? book one, not just in, you know, in content, but, and with these characters who, who now are friends, but like in process. Oh, well, it, the process that I used at that time was, was really different. Um, and of course the book is much, much, much shorter. It's about the, a third the length of, uh, of, of 
this this latest Lindley book. But um, what I did in, in, in those days, was because I really hadn't developed a process that was going to work for me at that time um, throughout, throughout my career. So I was basically uh, just sort of feeling my way through and uh, kind of planning each chapter as I went by just jotting down, okay, what could happen in this next chapter? Additionally, in that first book, I did not explore um, really any of the um, any of the subplots relating to the tangential characters. So uh, we knew we knew them, we saw them, but and we knew that they had uh, certainly had complicated lives. But as far as how they related to each other, and you know, really what they had done with their lives and how they fit into the community, there wasn't a great deal of of exploration of that. There was just just the one character in that first book that one that we learn um, had had this. Uh, had this baby that she uh, that she gave up because she was too afraid that the ch- that the baby that she had was going to end up with Huntington's chorea, which is the which is the curse of her family. So, uh, but that was basically it, you know. And everything else was uh, was really related directly to the to the crime itself. So, uh, I certainly did explore the location. Um, at, to, and and but it wasn't with nearly as much as much depth. There was you know I was just starting out. There was no one I could interview unless I ran into a policeman on the street. And believe me, that's what I did in the beginning. Is you know I'd see a policeman and say, Can I ask you a few questions, <laughs> you know, and and that's how I discovered a lot about police work initially. So it was totally different. And then over time, I developed the, a process. Uh, that really I saw worked for me and has continued to work for me low these many years. You should tell people what that process is because you you do such a beautiful job of talking. It's very inspiring when you talk about. Well, you know, I mean, it's it, it, it's super it's super long and involved. I don't know if anybody really wants to hear it, but. <laughs> You know, it really involves it involves doing the the foundation work. Basically, is that I I never sit down and just hope to get in touch with the cosmos and maybe a good yeah. good book will come out of this. Um, what I do is I start out with uh, you know when I I go over to England to to do the research and in advance of that I I have isolated an area of England that I want to go to. It's sometimes it is because somebody said something intriguing to me one time, a woman uh, came to a book sign and, and said, you really should write about uh, Lancashire, England. And, and I said, why should I write about Lancashire? And she said, because it's the witch country in England. And I uh, handed her a piece of paper and said, write down every place I should go, <laughs> you know, which she did. And uh, of course, if you write about the witch country in England, you are going to have to include a witch, which meant that I had to track down a witch uh, in that area of uh, of England who was actually willing to uh, to talk to me and be interviewed yes. by me. And 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 so so that's how I you know that's basically how I begin is with the you know with the location, and I'm always looking for a location that suggests story to me. Sometimes when I go there, I know what the what the crime's going to be. Sometimes I have the slightest idea what the crime's going to be. Um, and I just am hoping against hope that the location will give me inspiration. And so far um, in the times when I have not known what the crime is going to be when I go to a location, the location does indeed do that. In the case of this book, I knew what the crime was going to be. So I was looking for locations uh, where my characters, individual characters would actually live and operate. Um, so that's basically where I began with the location research with a massive amount of note taking and photographing. And then um, after that, when I come home, uh, I you know organize all of that stuff. So that, uh, you know, because I immediately have to go, we have all these pictures uh, printed and then identify all the places in the pictures because, you know, I'm going to forget where they were if I don't put exactly where I take the photograph. So I do that. And then at that point, um, I have a, I have the idea of the crime. And so I peopled the world of that crime generically just by saying, you know, okay, so I've got this for who's the, who's the killer? Yeah, the mailman, 
who's the victim, little old lady. I don't know anything more than that. And I come up with a whole list of characters who are potentials to people the world of this crime. And then looking at those characters, I select the ones that are going to actually be in the book and uh, not only people the world, but act as potential suspects as well. And then I create all of those characters one at a time. And so that that's basically, you know, basically the beginning. And then I, you know, do this thing with <laughs> <laughs> thing that I hate to do the most is that I then I uh, do a, a basically a, what I call a step outline. It's a uh, an organization of scenes so that they're causally related. And I just lay them out on the floor. I try to go for 10 scenes. I don't know how you do, you do any of this stuff, Lauren. I mean, I mean, I try to because every time I hear you talk about it, I think that's what I should do. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, it's just like, if I don't do this, I end up just sort of writing in the dark and plus I forget. I mean, yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I'm working on a book right now and <laughs> it's not a Lily book. It's the final book in my young adult series. And I swear, um, you know, the, the running plot outline is really <laughs> very, very detailed. And then I'll be going, I'll be looking at it thinking when I get to the rough draft, I'll be thinking, didn't I write this already? Yeah. Isn't this like in another part of the book? That's what's so hard for me. And then I've got all this stuff that I have to keep straight. So, so the, you know, the step outline and the running plot outline really, really helped me do that. And then um, afterwards I do a, uh, like a, um, a summary of each chapter. And I just do it like I'll do put the name of the point of view character and like what happened in that chapter to that person and to the next point of view her character and the next point of view character in that chapter. And then I've got this document that I can refer to. to, to I, and I refer to it to make sure I haven't already told something and I, you know, it's done something in the book. And then I refer to it also to, uh, to just sort of remind myself where I was, you know, where I've been heading on this, on this journey. It takes really a long time to write a book. And it's, there's just way too much to keep in my hand. Well, okay. But then at that point, how clean is the draft that comes out of that? Like you've done all of this prep work and then you sit down and write the thing. Is it perfect or close to perfect? Um, so you mean the rough draft? Yeah. yeah. Like your first draft. Okay. So when I do not have the problem I, I had with this book, which yes. had to do with the chronology, the rough draft is, I would say, usually pretty darn good. Yeah. And, uh, and so when I go into these, so then what I do is I, uh, I sit down and read that rough draft in as few sittings as I can possibly manage. And I'm just yeah. trying to get an idea of like, okay, you know, what, what is this book? What's it like? And I, um, I, I sort of make notes on post-its and slap them on the manuscript. And, and when I finished, then I, uh, you know, I write myself an editorial letter telling me, you know, giving myself many compliments and then, uh, you know, and telling myself, this is what you need to do next. This, here's how you can improve the book. And I basically, you know, tell myself what I have to do. Like I might say, uh, you have too many scenes with Barbara Havers, or I might say, you know, uh, so, so and so's relationship really needs to be improved, or I might say, eliminate this entire subplot, yeah. and then uh, and then I go and then I do a subsequent reading, and at that point I'm slashing basically. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. I'm getting rid of anything that just really doesn't belong there. It may not uh, support the theme of the book. Um, it just, it may be just clunky, uh, it may be extraneous, whatever. And then I, I slash, and then I begin the, the second draft using that hard copy of the first draft as a guide, of the rough draft as a guide. Yeah. And when I'm really lucky, you know, by the, I send the second, if I have enough time, which I haven't lately, I send the second draft to my cold reader. Um, she's an English teacher, a uh, former, she's a retired English teacher now, but she, I used to teach with her and uh, she's not a, she's not um, a writer and not a wannabe writer. So she's a really good, she's a huge reader. So I send her the dr a draft and get her comments on it. And from that, I write the, uh, the next draft and that's generally the one that i that goes to my publisher at that point yes. so it's usually my um 
usually my third or fourth draft is the one that my publisher sees. I never send my rough draft, you know, because I don't want to get an editorial letter that's 55 pages long. <laughs> Well, or mean, because, you know, it's, these are, these are, this is your love. It's like your soul on the page. So yeah. you want it to be good before you send it off. Yeah. I want it to be as good as I can possibly, you know, as good as I can possibly get it. I mean, what I'm really trying to do is I, I'm really trying to, you know, make, make, as I said earlier, make each book a leap ahead from the last book. I mean, I would, I'd like somebody to be able to look back at my career and, and see it along the lines of, of John le Carre's career. You know, John le Carre's initial books, they were really simple, like uh, Murder of Quality, Small Town in Germany, even The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, which was this huge breakout book. Um, you know, they were all pretty simple books. And as he went along, you know, and, and as he matured as a writer, his books just kept getting better and better and better and better until, you know, and my permit for my money, his masterpiece was The Perfect Spy, a book that a lot of people <laughs> hated. I loved it. Um, and of course, The Constant Gardener, I thought was magnificent. And so that's what I really, you know, I I really admire is when a writer, I can see the uh, the the projection of a writer's career. I can see where this person began and, and where the person uh, either ended up upon his death or where the person is at this point, you know, like 20 years later into their career. Yes. Elizabeth, you're amazing. All right, we have questions, which is super. Um, I'm gonna read them to you and I have more questions too, but we might not have time for my thousands of questions. We have to have lunch instead. Um, okay. so. Here's one of the questions. I'd like to suggest for my book club, um, she'd like to recommend this book for her. This is someone named Susie who would like to recommend this book for her book club. Do they need to know the characters? Can they start with this one? I'm assuming that you mean the, the continuing characters. And yeah, uh, and no, they, they don't need to have background knowledge on the continuing characters. Each book, uh, I strive for each book to be a standalone book so that you can read them actually in any order. Ultimately, were you to read them in order, you get the full story of the characters, but each book also has the full story of the characters at this point in time. So no, they don't really need to know uh, the continuing characters. They could be meeting them just for the very first time as they read this book, yeah. Yeah, which I have to say is is a minor miracle. It is really impressive. I think it's a very difficult thing to do, it seems to me, to make it both an overarching story, but also if you just read this one, you aren't lost, is, right. a, is a formidable trick, I think. Right, yeah, it, it is It is tricky. Um, but I, but I, you know what it adds to though? I think it adds to that sense of the reader entering into lives that have been going on before right. this moment and will continue to go on after this moment. Yeah. Like the reader in, in this in this in this book may not know who um, who Salvatore Lo Bianco is, but they do get the idea that that he is somehow significant to the other characters in this book. And then uh, and then ultimately the reader sort of discovers how and why he's significant. But uh, but but I don't do a big song and dance like, well, what is this <laughs> Italian detective you think yeah, in this right. book? You know, he's yeah. there. He's there. He's there to you know to learn English, to improve his English. He speaks really horrible English, and so he's decided he wants to learn English, and he has his own reasons for that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I'm. It's. It's amazing and it's also very inspiring. All right, Stephanie wants to know all these years and I'm still thinking of Lindley and Barbara, do you still enjoy them the way I do? Absolutely, absolutely. As I said earlier, um, the first moment they appear on, on the page, um, I, it's a great pleasure for me. And I, I really can't imagine it being anything else than a great pleasure. And I think it's because, you know, well, first of all, I created characters who are complicated. I, I set out with the because I wanted to prove the following uh, idea. Let's say I believed two things about 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 people about characters. The first is that I believe that people can overcome the pain of past relationships 
and move forward with those exact people that they've had this painful relationship with and be able to, uh, to have a, uh, a friendship, a, a, a warmth that still exists even after the pain that was uh, incurred through the relationship. That was one thing. And you see that um, through, the, uh, through Lindley and, uh, and St. James and his wife, Deborah, and they have a very complicated past uh, and, and, and a very devastating past, but they have moved beyond it. The other thing that I wanted to explore was, was my feeling, my belief, that a, a man and a woman could uh, work together and they could come to love each other very much and the love could be absolutely non-sexual. And yeah. that was what I was doing with Lindley and Havers. And so in the very beginning, when uh, Barbara is assigned in the first book to work with Lindley, and she loathes him because Lindley, you know, she's working class and Lindley is uh, definitely not working class. And so uh, Weberly, who makes this connection between them, uh, says to her, there's a lot you might learn from working with Lindley. And that's why he puts them together, because what he knows about Lindley is he's a man of infinite compassion. And she doesn't know that because she's never worked with him. And so she she discovers that. And now as their relationship has grown over the years, um, it's, you know, there's there's just really elements of, of wonderful humor in the way they uh, the way they treat each other, the way they talk to each other, especially the way Barbara talks to him. I mean, she has absolutely no respect for anybody. And <laughs> I have a lot of fun with that. I have huge fun with her T-shirts, I must say. <laughs> and her whole manner of dress is just, you know, it obviously she'd be fired long ago. She was really a detective sergeant. But uh, but I just I just love that. And in part because you know, she, she does some of the things she does because she knows it drives Lindley crazy and yeah. she enjoys that. <laughs> yes. I love her snack. I yeah, she's always eating. Yeah. Well, always in this book, me. and this one of my my favorite scenes in this book is when she and Lindley are they're going like they're driving to talk to somebody. Neither from had lunch, and she keeps pulling things out of her purse <laughs> <laughs> to, give, to give to him, and and pretty soon he's, he just says that you know no 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 it's <laughs> it's beyond what he can eat yeah because she's just got all kinds of oh it's massive amount of sugar and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I'm writing those scenes, I just, I have to laugh. I laugh, I chuckle. You know, these people, like, they're really real to me, obviously. Yes. Well, and, it, and I can feel that when I read it. It comes across on the page, um, <laughs> which, is, which is your job, and you're very good at it. All right, Connie wants to know, um, oh, wait, hold on. I skipped a question, and I want to go back to it. So it's two more questions so far. Um, do you want to comment on the masterpiece, the PBS Oh, the the oh the, the um yeah the the series that they did with uh, called the Lindley Mysteries. Yeah. Um, well, you know, my whole thing about uh, about television or film is that you really, as a writer, need to kiss it goodbye if you're going to sell to uh, sell your book to be put into uh, a screenplay. Because you can just get yourself all wrapped up emotionally uh, with with what the uh, with what the writers are doing, but what that's going to really do is is bleed away your own creativity for whatever project you're working on now. So when I sold to uh, to the BBC, my hope was, and this is really my sole hope, was that the shows would be good enough to bring more readers to my books. Because what I knew is that the books were better than the shows and that the books provided a much bigger experience for people than the shows did. And so, I, you know, and, I, and over time that, that is what happened. Uh, would I have cast those, uh, those two actors as Lindley and Havers? Uh, no, but I do think that they uh, that they did catch the flavor of Lindley and Havers in those in the early novels that they did. So uh, so I thought that uh, that Sharon was you know was really a pretty good Barbara Havers. She really had the chip on her shoulder, and uh, Nathaniel was was kind of a smooth Lindley. Um, as I said, they wouldn't have been my choices, but I think they did a pretty good job with it. The actors, yeah, yeah. awesome. 
Me too. Me too, I thought so. Um, all right, Connie's question is a really good one, which is how do you feel about writing your YA novels in contrast to, she says, these major adult works? I enjoy both, especially knowing Whidbey somewhat. Um, you know, I, when I set out to do the, the YA novels, it was mostly because um, I thought it would be interesting to set, you know, to use Whidbey Island as a YA setting because there's so much there's so much there and there's so many things that young people could become involved in on on with the island um uh, one thing i discovered in very short order <laughs> said it was a whole hell of a lot more difficult than i thought it was going to be um because i'm an adult writer you know so so there's certain um you know th there's you have, to have to have a certain amount of reservations about what it is you're going to write if you're writing young adult fiction and uh so so whereas I really enjoyed the process of creating the characters and, um, and I really think the stories are, are good uh, because each one is, is, you know, features something totally different. Uh, it was, I, I wish the books had, um, had done a little bit better than they actually did do in the marketplace. And, um, and so what I intend to do um, when I finish this last YA book is I am going to revise the first four YA books and uh, make them uh, make them tighter and a little bit different from what they are now. And in part, it was because when I began, it's like anything else. I learned more about the characters as I went along because it's the same people in, in, you know, in, well, now five books. So obviously I didn't know every single thing about them. And now I know more, which would really help me if I were to go back and look at the, the first books again. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back and strengthen those first, uh, first four novels. And then, and, and then also have the fifth novel as well. Interesting. And what, like you re-release them? Yeah, I hope. Yeah. yeah, maybe not, but you know what? It's part of it is just like, I just want to do it for myself, you know. I yeah. still have. I mean, the miracle is that I still actually have them um, on my on one of my computers. You know, I write on a computer <laughs> that is basically a souped up. It's like I use it as a souped up typewriter. My writing computer <laughs> does nothing else. It does absolutely oh. nothing else. It is only for writing. I don't do the internet on that. I do nothing but write, and so that allows. If you know, that allows. That allows a computer yeah. to be pretty faithful, and it's a big desktop computer. Anyway, but just serendipitously, I managed to find, by doing some serious searching through my files on that computer, I found the first four novels. I, they, are still, they were still there, alive and kicking. So uh, that, that's going to give me the freedom to, uh, to do, you know, to go back and to look at them and see what I can come up with to improve them. And we'll see what happens. But at yeah, least I'll yeah. know that I like them better, you know, that I will have done a better job the second time. So interesting. Is it is it easier? Is it more fun? Is it more interesting to write about someplace you don't live than someplace Absolutely. You, did, you did live at the time? Yeah, you know, it, it, it has always been easier for me to write about a place where I don't live. And yeah. uh, from the very, very beginning, when I was in high school, I did a group of short stories that were set in uh, in the exotic place of Manchester, England. I'd never been to Manchester. That was not a problem. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it sort of never occurred to me <laughs> that if I was going to write about England, you know, it might help if I lived there. But that, yeah, yeah that kind of thing never bothered me. So, uh, and and so what I discovered is, yeah, it's a lot easier for me to write about a place where I don't live because I see the details in a place where I don't live. Whereas in a place where I do live, well, I'm, I'm passing stuff every day. It's right. really hard. I got to tell you, I have so much respect for people who can uh, to set their novels where they live and make that place real. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know how they do it and I don't think I could do it, but I really admire people who do do it. Yeah. Yes. So interesting. So interesting. Okay. We are, we got four minutes. I feel like actually, I think Elaine's going to come on and, and tell us to shut up, but I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, if I could, which is about the dedication, um, and, or if you preferred the epigraph, both of which are really, um, touched me. I mean, I, I was, uh, I was a little bit 
teared up before I even started the book. Um, first, I had to get over the cover of London and how I hadn't been there in so long. <laughs> but then also um, this dedication for those who suffer, those who endure, and those who fight. Um, I know some of this is you've written a lot of books, and so all of the usual suspects you must have already dedicated a book to. <laughs> but um, it's really, really a heartfelt um, way to begin a book. Um, so maybe we could end on on your talking about that. Well, you know, um, well at, at the end of this book, and it really, it really wasn't like the <laughs> having dedicated it to the usual suspects. Um, my friend Jeff Parker has dated. I think he said about 10 books that he's dedicated to his wife. And that's so really sweet. But, you know, well, I don't do that. No, you know what? That dedication seemed really appropriate considering the subject yes. matter and considering the number of women who are involved in this fight. So that was that was the purpose of it. It just it, it really fit in. Generally, what I do is when I dedicate a book, the person knows why I've dedicated it to them once they read the book. Then they realize, oh, wait a minute. OK, I get it. I know why she dedicated it to me. Yeah. Beautiful. It was beautiful. Congratulations. This book is amazing. Oh, thank you, Lauren. And you are also amazing and lovely. Oh, and you are too, by the way. And I think that now needs to be revealed that you actually flew to London prior to COVID. Yes. Prior have to have you done it twice now? Yes, I have. Yes. <laughs> okay. It needs to be revealed that Lori Frankel flew to London to see uh -huh. Hamilton. Twice. Twice yes. <laughs> well, the first time I went without my kid and then she was pissed <laughs> off. So obviously I have to go back. <laughs> oh, I think that's the greatest story. <laughs> well, I am a musical theater geek and um, an Anglophile and the combination is, oh, yeah. Um, is, yeah, is powerful stuff. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I see Thanks you Thanks to both of you. You're so amazing. And, uh, <laughs> I, I love that Hamilton story. I wish I'd had the guts to do that. That's the move. It's really amazing. Uh, but, uh, and what a wonderful hour. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I just want to remind our uh, the almost 400 people who are with us that uh, we really appreciate your supporting us all the time. And uh, I hope that you'll support us and our authors tonight by coming into Book Passage or Third Place Books or coming online to either of our uh, websites. And uh, you can ask for a book with a book plate in it. So you definitely want to get uh, one, two, three. I didn't have time to go into it. I could give you a two hour thing. <laughs> As could Elizabeth, as to why this is such an amazing book. Your book club wants to read it. Uh, give it to anyone who wants a great story or who cares. About and can I just book. can I just add something, Elaine? Um, Please. The the Laura's prior book. This is how it always is. Is uh, is de it is also a uh, a magnificent must read. Uh, so you know, definitely, if you haven't read, this is how it always is. But you definitely put that on your list because it is unforgettable. It's a wonderful. Now, book. Both of these women have so much depth in what they write, and in both cases, you come away saying, "I can't let those characters go. I kind of need to go back and look at that again because they've become so much a part of our lives." Mm -hmm. And in here, here are these two amazing women on screen together. And of course, uh, don't forget that you need something to hide. You will be very, very unpopular if people <laughs> expect you to cook dinner yeah. when you're reading this. But you are going to have the most amazing time and uh, you're going to think, oh my goodness, can I read this again? It's only 700 plus. <laughs> <laughs> but and when you order from us or when you come into either of our stores be sure to ask for a copy with a book plate because uh both stores will have book plates and we just can't wait to see what these two amazing women are going to do next and i do have to have one personal thing sharon cheryl mckeon came to work at book passage from 
third place book several years ago. And then she moved to, of all places, Albany, New York. <laughs> now she works at the book house. And I know that she is on tonight and that uh, if she could, she would be hosting this event. So thank you, Cheryl, for being with us and to all uh, of you. Thank you. For part of tonight. It was a magical conversation. Awesome. Thanks, thank Elaine. you all. And thank you, Lori. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Cheryl.